Well, from that kind of brief summary of the Friday material, let's move on to something significant. I should say something more significant. Right triangles and three what we call trigonometric function. So we're going to introduce what we call the sine, the cosine, and the tangent. And then either today or Friday, we'll introduce three more trig functions, but we'll start with these. So as a reminder, when we say right triangle, we mean a triangle with a right angle in it. So you might have, you know, I don't, I'm very bad at estimating angles visually, but maybe that's 40 degrees, and maybe that's 50 degrees. So triangles have the property that if two triangles are similar in the sense of having the same angles, if we look at another triangle with 40 degrees, 50 degrees, 90 degrees, well, of course, one of those triangles is bigger than the other. The sides aren't the same, but triangles have the property that the ratios of the sides are the same as long as the angles are the same. So if we call this A, B, C, we call this lowercase a, lowercase b, and lowercase c, then for example, capital A divided by capital B is the same as lowercase a divided by lowercase b. Um, or capital C divided by capital A is the same as lowercase c divided by lowercase a, and so on. So these ratios are fixed. They don't depend on how big the triangle is. They just depend on the angles. Now, let me also make the observation. Um, I've said, okay, we have a right triangle. This is a 40 degree angle. This is a 50 degree angle. The degrees of a triangle have to add up to be 180. So if we've got the right angle the same and we've got the 40 degrees the same, we have to have the 50 in both cases automatically. So if we've got that right angle, then one of the angles being the same means that both the angles are the same and these ratios are true. And I just put two ratios down because I didn't want to be tedious, but I mean, 
All these ratios, uh, capital A over capital C equals lowercase a over lowercase c, and so on. So we're going to give these ratios a name. You'll we'll say we have a right triangle. We'll label one of the angles and the Greek letter theta is traditionally used for angles in a lot of situations. And now we're going to label the sides of the triangle. Opposite. I mean, if we think of this angle as B standing in the corner of the room, that's the opposite side of the room. This adjacent always feels have it written in my notes. Somehow words that I spell, but I was right. I was right to think this looked wrong. Adjacent just has a C in it. So adjacent means next to, and again, if I'm sitting here in the corner, the wall is right next to me, hence the naming convention. And the so-called hypotenuse. From this, I'm going to define some things. Any triangle with that angle theta is going to have the same ratio the same opposite side over the hypotenuse, the same adjacent side over the hypotenuse, the same adjacent side over the opposite side, and so on. We will say that the sine of theta is the length of the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse, the length of the hypotenuse. And that's abbreviated S-I-N. These all get three letter abbreviations. Sine theta is the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse. So if we have a right triangle, theta can be here. I won't say what theta is, but if the rest of the triangle looks like this, if its sides are 17, 15, and eight, then the sine of theta is eight, seven cheats. The cosine is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. The cosine, as you 
my guess is abbreviated COS. So the adjacent side is 15. The hypotenuse is 70. And finally, the tangent abbreviated tan. Oh, well, why I wrote the word away. Yeah, I'll say in a minute. Um, it's the opposite side over the adjacent side. So where is that example? Here it is. The tangent of theta opposite over adjacent. So all there are six possible fractions you could make out of the sides, and all six have their own names, and we'll talk about the other three. But via, at this point, centuries old and immutable um, tradition, these are the angles, I should say, these are the ratios that we think of as being most important. Let me point out that if you know any two sides of a triangle, of a right triangle, one of these trig functions, the sine, the cosine, or the tangent, relates the two of them. That is to say, if you know the adjacent side and the hypotenuse, the cosine relates them. If you know the adjacent side and the opposite side, the tangent relates them. If you know the opposite side and the hypotenuse, um, the sine relates them. So if you know two sides of a right triangle, they are related and you can use the sine, the cosine and the tangent to express that relationship. So, memory aids. I mean, many of you might have seen this already in like high school geometry or something. Um, this is, uh, I mean, I guess the standard memory aid is Soka Oa um, so, sine opposite hypotenuse, cosine adjacent hypotenuse, tangent opposite adjacent. I, back when I was taking high school geometry, our textbook offered a different memory aid, which seemingly a very effective one. My older brother, who has a PhD in literature and went to a college, the Sarah Lawrence, specifically because they didn't have any kind of math requirement, still uh, has this memory aid burned into his mind. 
some old horse, catch another horse. Hey, oops, away. Well, no matter how you remember it, or no matter what memory aid you use, the definition of the sine, the cosine, and the tangent are fundamental, and you need to get it down if it is not down already. So let me see. We did this example. Um, when you're working with right triangles, you're basically always going to be working with the sine, the cosine, and the tangent. Just out of, it, it's such an ancient convention, your calculator has sine, cosine, tangent buttons. It doesn't have nice buttons for the other three trig functions. But there are three other trig functions. And those three other trig functions correspond to the three other relationships. So we have opposite over hypotenuse. There's another trig function that's hypotenuse over adjacent. We have, sorry, I, I when I when I say it, I get muddled. But we have opposite over hypotenuse. There's another trig function that's the hypotenuse over the opposite. We have the adjacent over the hypotenuse, um, the cosine. There's another trig function. That's the hypotenuse over the adjacent. And we have the opposite over the adjacent. That's the tangent. There's another trig function. That's the adjacent over the opposite. So these other trig functions are, we'll define them, we won't define them at once in terms of right triangles. Instead, we'll define them in terms of the trig functions we've just seen. The secant. is one divided by the cosine. That is, a, that is actually the definition you should memorize for the secant, because we so rarely use the secant when we're working with right triangles, memorizing the secant in terms of the adjacent and the opposite and all that stuff doesn't really make sense. If we ever needed that information, though, we could figure it out. The cosine is the adjacent over the hypotenuse so the secant is the hypotenuse over the adjacent the secant for reasons that it's hard to explain unless you take calculus 
is the fourth most important trig function. You learn the sine, the cosine, and the tangent in high school, or at least you might, depending on your courses. So you sort of think of those as being the most important, and then the secant in number four, and kind of tied oh, our abbreviation of the secant is just what you'd expect, SEC. And sort of tied in the last place is the cosecant and the cotangent. In spite of saying that, you ought to know these definitions. So the cosecant is one divided by the sine. Again, we don't really uh, want to memorize the right triangle stuff for the cosecant because it's very rarely used when you're working with right triangles. But the sine is the opposite side over the hypotenuse and one divided by a fraction is the reciprocal of the fraction. And the cosecant um, gets an anomalous abbreviation. We've already used COS. So CSC. Not only Shadron State College, also the abbreviation for the cosecant. Finally, the cotangent is one over the tangent. It's the adjacent side over the opposite in terms of right triangles. And we're back to just the abbreviation being the first three letters. The abbreviation of the cotangent is cot. So the reason I say that um, well, that the last three trig functions are less important than the first three trig functions is again that the first three trig functions already relate all of the sides of the triangle. So if you know the hop if you know the hypotenuse and you know the opposite, we can use the side to relate them. So the cosecant, which also relates them, isn't so important because we already have a tool that does the job for us. Um, I myself have never totally understood the naming conventions of these trig functions. Um, they're not intuitive. I mean, there are three that have po in front of them and three that don't. The cotangent is one divided by the tangent, but the cosecant is not one divided by the secant, and the cosine is not one divided by the sine, and the cos don't match. You might think, okay, the cosecant should be one divided by the cosine. It isn't. The co here is not matched with the co here. Meanwhile, the secant 
no po gets a function that does have a co in it. It's, I've never, as I say, never fully understood it myself. It's just something that has to be learned. So we'll do examples with right triangle trigonometry, as you might certainly hope. Um, we're going to go on kind of a digression. We're giving you a lot to memorize this, uh, this lecture, I'm afraid. There are a few standard angles whose sines, cosine, just sines and cosines, really, but whose sines and cosines, trig students are asked to commit to memory. And I, I really think it's just a pedagogical thing. I think it's so that textbook authors can do examples where we know what the sine and the cosine are and don't have to reach for our calculator. But these sort of famous angles, which whose sine and cosine get committed to memory are 45 degrees, that's pi over four radians, 30 degrees, that's pi over six radians, and 60 degrees, that's pi over three radians. Let's find the sine and the cosine of 45 degrees, pi over four radians. So the way we're going to do this, I mean, I could just, can just tell you what they are. In fact, maybe, Maybe that would be a good idea. I'll write the formula down and then we'll see where it comes from. The sine of 45 degrees pi over four radians is the square root of two divided by two. And the cosine of pi over four radians, 45 degrees, happens to be exactly the same thing. The sine, um, 45 degree angles are special. The sines and the cosines are the same. Where this comes from, Let's draw a right triangle. This isn't really the scale, but if a right triangle has one 45 degree angle, it has two 45 degree angles. Again, because there have to be 180 degrees. Um, so this triangle is isosceles. You may remember means that the two legs of the triangle have to have the same lengths. Well, when we're looking at sines and cosines, we've seen that the actual size of the triangle doesn't matter whether we blow it up and look at a big triangle or shrink it down and look at a tiny triangle, the side and the cosine are going to be the same. So let's look at a triangle whose hypotenuse is one. B 
because that's isosceles, the two lengths are the same. Let's call them A. And then the good old Pythagorean theorem, we know it well, I hope, says that A squared plus A squared equals one squared. So 2a squared is 1, a squared is 1 over 2, a is 1 over the square root of 2, except that there's this, um, speaking of things I've never quite understood, but there's this long running mathematical tradition that says you're not supposed to have square roots in the denominator of a fraction. I myself have never understood why that is, but the way to get rid of a square root is to rationalize like that. You multiply the fraction as one by one, but you write one in that funny way. Square root of two over two. So we know what A is and we know that this is the square root of two over two. And now the sine of 45 degrees, well, the sine is the opposite over the hypotenuse. Dividing by one doesn't do anything, so we can erase the hypotenuse part of that. And we get that the sine of 45 degrees is the square root of two over two. And then that's also pi over four radians. So the sine of pi over four, the cosine pi over four. And I'm going to run out of time if I try to say where these come from, but I can write them down. The sine of pi over six, it is vanishingly rare that you take a sine or a cosine and you get a nice number. But the sine of pi over six is a nice number. It's one half. The, the cosine makes up for it by not being nice at all. The cosine is the square root of three over two. So the good news is, I mean, memorizing these is a hassle, at least I thought it was, but there are only three relevant values here. There's the square root of two over two, there's one half, and there's the square root of three over two. And that's because 30 degrees and 60 degrees, pi over three and pi over six. They have the same signs and cosines, they're just reversed. So the sine of pi over six, is the square root of three over two, the cosine of pi over six is, sorry, is one half.
And these should be committed to memory. I mean, it's supposed to be three for those high over three. Uh, absolutely correct. Said about sometimes my mouth just moves, sometimes my hand just moves too. Um, these should be committed to memory. I mean, it's not a huge deal in this class because, I mean, realistically, you should do trig with a calculator and you'll be using a calculator and you can just plug in sines and cosines and find them. I mean, really, I'm including this at all just because if someone is taking this class as a prereq like for a class at another college, or if someone transfers, their professor is going to assume they know these values, and it wouldn't be right to just not cover them. But we're going to be using the calculator heavily in this class, and if we need a sine or a cosine, we'll just plug it in. Uh, two minutes I have remaining, or one minute now, but that's fine. This will just take a moment. Let me load the calculator up real quick. So you see the sine, cosine, tangent have dedicated buttons to them. The secant, cosecant, and cotangent do not. If you wanted the secant, you type one divided by the cosine. Again, it's important that we always know whether what is happening. This calculator. Oh, Mo. Yeah, I'm so used to pressing that second button, but I didn't need to here. What I was saying is it's always important to know are you using degrees? Are you using radians? So we're currently in radians. If you type the sign of 45, you are not going to get. The square root of two divided by two, because this is 45 radians, not 45 degrees. And with that, I will see you uh, Friday.